Hi everyone, welcome to Red Dragon TV and here we are off the back of the World Championships. The Masters is on the horizon and we've got none other than Jules, Colin Lloyd. Colin, fresh off the world, did you enjoy your stint on comms and spotting and everything? Absolutely loved it, mate, loved it. It was, um, it was something different for me. Obviously I do the podcast and all that sort of thing, but with them sort of things, Phil, you can re-record it. Yeah. Uh, there you're live and in the moment. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. It was something different from doing the spotting. And uh, you never know, maybe, maybe I might get some more. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> the, the world's, look, kudos to, to Sky. We had a thousand fans in there on opening night. And yeah. the transformation, they, they turned it around in 12 hours, was unbelievable to make it look aesthetically amazing on yeah. the eye. Because those that haven't been to Ali Pali, that hall is huge. And obviously, we walked around it. It was quite eerie, wasn't it, after night one? Yeah, it was. It, it, it was great to see see the crowd in there for the first night. And it was lovely as well that Peter Wright could get up there as defending champion and play in front of a crowd. Unfortunately, COVID reared this ugly head again. And uh, unfortunately, there was no more crowd at the end of it. But the stage did look fantastic, like you say. But it did feel really strange. As of when I went to do um, a bit of studio work, um, sitting at the end of the other bit of runway, as I call it, it was fantastic, Phil. It was absolutely amazing. But like you say, it just seemed really strange. We're used to, you know yourself, because you've been there. I've been fortunate to play down there. Um, you're used to that buzz and that, you know, that atmosphere. And um, I still got a little bit of goosebumps walking through there, looking at the stage, thinking, well, I wouldn't mind being up there again, you know. But, um, yeah, it was very strange. But the PDC and, and Sky, they put on a fantastic event again. And we got a new world champion. Before we come on to that, I just want to touch on the Peter Wright thing. Obviously, it can never be taken away from him. He was the 2020 world champion. But yeah. when he looks back on it, is it slightly tainted, the fact that he didn't have the proper world champion year? I know it can never be erased from the history books or anything like that. Yeah. But mentally, when he looks back at his career, has something been taken away, the varnish off of being the world champion? It, it, it has and it hasn't. You know, Peter worked extremely hard. He's worked extremely hard throughout his whole career. And he got rewarded by being crowned world champion. Um, but, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I, I've said it a few times when I've been chatting with people. He's been very unfortunate in the fact that Peter is a guy for the fans. You know, the fans love him. He loves the fans. And he hasn't had the chance to go not only around Great Britain and Europe, but around the world as the Professional Darts Corporation world champion. Um, yeah, that'll hurt a little bit. But I think Peter said it in an interview, I'll just have to win it again. Yeah. And then I can go back out and um, then I can see all the fans. But listen, it, it, it was unfortunate for, for Peter. Phil, and, you know, he was a great world champion. You know, he played some great stuff after being crowned world champion. And um, hopefully that's what people will remember, that he was a great world champion, throwing fantastic darts, and he continued in that rich vein of form. And he held his head high. And I would say that the PDC were very proud to have him as their world champion. Moving on to this one. Across the year, did the right man win this world title? Because across the year, statistically, he's been the best player. He's yeah. won the, the, the most tournaments on, on and off the TV. Mm. But it doesn't always happen. But for this year, he rode his luck early on at, at <laughs> times. Jamie Lewis pushed him to the max. But yeah. from the quarterfinals onwards, the Iceman was sensational. Uh, he, uh, he played brilliant. Price, he played great. Um, he saw he could have come unstuck against Bunting. Bunting threw well against him, but the way that Gallowin, as they say now, the way he plays, he believes in himself so much. And when you've got that belief, Phil, in your game, um, you feel as though you still can't be beat. So when he was four sets to four sets to one down, I think it was, against Stephen Bunting, he still didn't think he could lose. He still thought he could win. And when you've got them positives within yourself. And the year that he's had leading up to the World Championships, he was throwing fantastic. He was, and probably rightly so, crowned world champion 
because of his whole year round play. He was the he was Mr. Consistency. You know, he's 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 played so well and he's done it in such a short period of time in number of years, as to the majors he's won and defended majors as well, and gone to world number one, all through hard work and dedication. So for me, yeah, very justified to be a world champion. I was sort of hoping that Michael would fire up, and, and he did, but unfortunately he walked into a rampant Chisnell um, who threw an unbelievable game, which we know Chizzy can do. Um, but listen, in, in the final, and fair play to Gary Anson, Gary Anson said the better man won. You know, Gunnarwin was thrown absolutely brilliantly. He was taking out absolutely everything. And sometimes when you're an opponent of someone doing that, you get a little bit deflated. And I've always said it, Phil, you can only control what you're doing as a player. You can't control what your opponent's doing. And fortunately enough for Gezi, he was the man. The new season is on the horizon, though. The Masters next weekend starts in Milton Keynes, sadly behind closed doors. New format as well. We've gone to, to 24. First of all, are you, are you a fan or, or not a fan of the new format? No, I'm not a fan. The Masters has always been the top 16 in the world. And for me, that's what made it elite, Phil. For me, that's what made it elite. If you're going to go from 16, I can't see the point of having, for me, it's like a prelim game. You put in eight more plays, you might as well put in the next 16. Put the top 32 in. That still keeps it a little bit more elite because it's the top 32 players in the world. But I would, I would have preferred the top 16. But listen, the, the PDC are trying to do everything they can to keep the top players involved in darts or keep everybody involved in darts. And so they've obviously had a little powwow around the table and thought to themselves, right, we're going to do something a little bit different. But myself personally, it's either top 16 or top 32. No, I, I'm fully in agreement there, there with you. If you're going to do it, for me, the top 32 makes more sense. But hey-ho, Matt and Barry don't often get it wrong, do they? So we'll, we'll, we'll go with them. <laughs> but looking ahead, those prelim first-round games, whatever you want to call them, has thrown up some mouth-watering ties before the, before the seeds hit the arena. Joe Cullen against Stephen Bunting, first one up. Two men that their stock rose massively after the World Championships, and that should be a mouth-watering one. That uh, should be unbelievable. I mean, Bunting's flying the crest of a wave again. He's he's come back. You know, he, he disappeared for a little while. He, he's even admitted it himself. He lost form. He lost confidence. And there's no bigger or better place to find some form and get that confidence back than, than the biggest tournament on the planet. And that's exactly what he done. Um, but he's walking into someone, and I hope he never dropped his head and he hasn't dropped his head and he's still carried on working hard, is Joe Cullen. Um, Joe had a fantastic world championships. He was very unfortunate against MVG. Um, but we all chatted afterwards, and, you know, like myself, Wayne Mardle and, and John Parton, whatever, and I was chatting with Keith Della. He's got to walk away with his head held high because he was hitting everything. I mean, was it 21, 180s, was it? Something like that, yeah, it was just insane. You know, and, and he was unfortunate that Michael took out a couple of clinical shots. But Cullen against Bunting, if they're still in that rich vein of form, that could be an absolute cracker. And the winner of that gets to play the newly crowned world champion and world number one. 100%. We'll come on to him shortly. Another game that jumps off the page. Two players that need a big result after the world championships. Michael Smith and Adrian Lewis both fell at the first hurdle, both arguably two of the most talented natural players we've ever seen, but both going through a spell at the moment, aren't they? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't mean to say as blase as what is going to come out, but Adrian's been there, done it, got the T-shirt, if you know what I mean. Michael's in a similar sort of vein, but he hasn't got the majors. Adrian's got the majors. Adrian's got the big games under his belt. Michael's got the big games under his belt, but not with success. Like you say, Phil, they both need they both need a run. So for those two to clash with each other in the first rounds is a little bit unfortunate on the pair of them. 
But the good thing about it is they're both good professionals. They both know that it means an awful lot, this match. And hopefully, hopefully they've been both working very, very hard. I'm not saying they didn't work hard before the world, because they obviously did. They were just unfortunate with their results. But that could be, Phil, that could be an absolute belt of a game. We both know they can score very, very heavily. 180s for fun. But it's just a matter of if they both turn up with that game or whether one turns up and just rolls over the other one. But a, a great game in prospect. Then we've got a good old-fashioned darts dog scrap. Glenn Durant against Merv King. And I'm looking forward to this one. This is, yeah. this is darts at its purest old school shall we say, the two of them are just going to go up there and give it everything. Yeah, the, the thing that Merv's had a little bit of a resurgence of form and, and has certainly upped his confidence and that's showing in the darts. Um, Glenn obviously is, is our current um, Premier League champion. But after that, he went a little bit flat. We know he got COVID and whatever, and that obviously knocked the stuffing out of him a little bit. But when it comes back to the world, he um, he was a little bit iffy in the first game, but then went home and come back, and he, it showed flashes of what we know he's capable of. We we all know he's a fantastic dart player. Um, like you say, this I don't mean it sounded like this because I'm one of them as well. It's a battle of the oldies. <laughs> the thing about it is about those two guys. Neither of them will take a step back. They'll keep fighting till the very last dart was thrown. And again, Phil, that can end up being an absolute cracking game. And uh, hopefully it will be. Next up, Ian White, Mensor Sulevich. Again, Ian White didn't perform at the Worlds, didn't get a result. And Mensor came in for some some stick, shall we say, for his tactics against Gary Anderson. Mm. Both looking to put the world behind them, but for different reasons. Yeah, well, I, I actually thought Ian played really well at the Worlds. I think he ended up with a 98 average at the end yeah. of the match. Um, but unfortunately, it was it was a losing 98 average. Uh, Mensor, done what Mensor does, you know, he, he was playing his own game, doing his own thing. Uh, I'm not agreeing with it, and I'm not disagreeing with it. It's just down to the to the player at the time. But he knew that Gary Anderson was a fluent sort of player, and so he'd done his own thing. Those sort of tactics, I don't think, would work with Ian White. Because Ian White is a methodical player. He's not a rhythm player. Um, and I mean that in, with the greatest respect. That's you know, Ian's a class player. But again, they both, like you said, they both need a big game because they had very disappointing world championships. And again, that could be an absolute cracker. There's me saying, Phil, that I preferred it just to be the 16. And there's these games going on with these players with the eight that's been added. Um, but, yeah, that could be an absolute belt. If Mensor's on his game and Ian White's on his game, yeah, that could be that could be a humdinger. Just while we're on the tactics bit here, I know it's a very grey area and you're entitled to slow your opponent down to a, to a degree, but mm. in the world, did Mensor cross the line, in your opinion? I know it's a very fine line, but did, did he overstep it a little bit? <laughs> uh, if it had been me in my prime... I'd have probably been saying something to him at the break. Um, and it wouldn't have been, that would have been typical Colin Lloyd Essex. You know what I mean? But, uh, listen, the only thing you can say, Phil, uh, is when you've had your throw, when you walk up to the board, you retrieve your dart and you walk away from the hockey, you don't own the hockey anymore. Did he push? He pushed it a little bit. He pushed it quite a bit. But listen, there's nothing in the, the rule of the game to say that you have to throw quick because your opponent throws quick. I wouldn't have been happy with it. I wouldn't have been happy with it. I'd have probably been like Gary Anderson and I'd have probably had my say at the end of the game. Um, but fortunately enough for me, Phil, I don't have to run. <laughs> <laughs> up, up next, we've got one of our Red Dragon players, the ferret, Johnny Clayton, returns to action. A tough one. And um, Jose de Souza, the Grand Slam champion, both of these played played some good stuff. I'm looking forward to this game. I'm looking forward to seeing the ferret back in action. Yeah, th this could be an absolute belter. You know, Jose's obviously he has a, he's had a great year. He's been crowned Grand Slam champion and whatever. 
But Johnny Clayton as well, he's been crowned World Cup champion. So, you know, I think this is going to be a game where who wants it the most? They're both going to be up for it. You know, I sometimes think with Johnny, he just needs to concentrate that little bit more um, with when it comes down to his finishing. Say his last six to nine darts. He can score heavy anyway, Phil, but there's sometimes it just needs to stop and have a little think, or not stop and have a little think, but just stand there, have a look at the board, look at his score, and think, right, I can do this, that, and the other. It's the same with Jose de Sousa as well, though, because the amount of times that man leaves a non-finish, you just think to yourself, why didn't you just go for a big 19? Why did you try forcing a treble 20 when you had to move across the hockey? But listen, Phil, they've got their own games. The, the thing with the game in today's age is they're such heavy scorers and they, they think they can just hit a treble 20 at will or a treble 19 at will. So they just don't switch. But that gives your opponent confidence then because... You know, they haven't left themselves a finish. You, I could stand back and say, I've got six darts now. But that game, again, that could be that could be a corking game. If they're both on it, it I think it all boils down to, Phil, this, this event is who's been lazy since the world. Who's got back on it? Who's got back on the board and thought, right, Christmas is over, New Year's is over, or I'm out of the world and whatever, I'm going to enjoy New Year's, and then it's back on it. And that, that's for every single player on there. I know one person who will certainly have been on the dartboard, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Up next, Battle of the Younger Guns, Dimitri Vandenberg against Chris Doby. An mm. interesting game, and they're going to throw a subplot in here. The rumour mill is that Dimitri Vandenberg, because of the Premier League being put back, is booked in for that knee operation straight after the Masters. Now, subconsciously, would something like that play on a player's mind, knowing that you're going for major surgery as soon as the tournament's done? Uh, I don't think so. But if I was Dimitri Vandenberg, uh, if I got the call for the Premier League, I would turn it down. I would have the knee surgery. He's got to think... Well, that's why he's having it done, because the Premier League's being put back. So that's why he's jumping in and having it done now. Yeah, but it's neither here nor there, though, Phil. But he can't then have that thing in his head where... right. I've had the surgery done. Right, I must get fit, I must get fit, I must get fit. Get the knee strong, get the knee strong. Don't rush it. Yeah. Don't rush it. You know, let it happen in time. You know, he's got to think of longevity, not the here and now. Dimitri's a class player. You know, he's a major champion now. He's won the second biggest one of all. Um, so I wouldn't rush things if I was him. And he, he's had that knee brace on now for a good while, Phil. So I don't think that will play on his mind too much. And I don't think the surgery will play on his mind. Um, Chris Doby was very hit and miss at the world. But he showed grit and determination. He knew and knows that he's got the game to do damage to all the players. Um, it, I just hope that um, from the World Championships and now that he's carried on with the hard work. You know, he said he's been working hard on the board, so hopefully he's carried on with that hard work because this is an opportunity now. Next up, a repeat of the World Championship, and I'm looking forward to this one again. The Polish Eagle, Christopher Ratajski, taking on the Wizard, Simon Whitlock. Two players that had very good years and may produce a very good game at the Worlds as well. A repeat, please, gentlemen. <laughs> uh, yeah, Christoph. Christoph had a good world championship. Simon, like you say, Simon got given an opportunity because Lewis and um, Bunting both got COVID. And my word, Phil, did he grab it with both hands? And, you know, that, that show goes to show the grit and determination of Simon Whitlock. You know, we all know he's a grinder and he's a fighter. It's that typical Aussie grit, you know. And um, Simon won't give you anything. And Simon will be wanting to go back and go... You're getting it. I'm coming back. I'm coming back again, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, he'll go out at him and he'll attack the Christoph Rutowski throw. And that's the one thing, you know, that I love about Simon Whitlock. It's just there's nothing in between. It's just pure, relentless power scoring and try to take out everything. 
absolutely everything. I know that's the name of the game anyway, Phil, but he's someone that just purely attacks. He doesn't hold back, just constant attacking. So that could be an absolute belter because Christoph's still on a high from the World Championships. He'd have been disappointed the way that he went out of the World Championships, the way he played. But again, he's up to a new ranking high and he'll want to justify that ranking high. Last one of the first rounds, Daryl Gurney against Jeffrey Dijon. Super chin. We've, we've finally seen the old super chin return after yeah. a disappointing year at the Worlds. We saw the real Daryl Gurney at last. Yeah, he, I think Daryl knows that. I think he knows he had a, a very disappointing year. You know, I mean, you can have the disappointing weeks and disappointing tournaments, Phil, but you can't let it drag on for a whole year. And he bounced back at the World Championships. What a place to, to come back and, and play your proper stuff, you know. He'd have been disappointed the way that he went out. Um, I don't think he was played as consistently as he was as he had the other matches. But you know what? It, it's progress. He was showing and throwing the stuff that he knows he's capable of and what the Darton fraternity knows that he's capable of. So Jeffrey Desran's still a little bit too hit and miss for me. When he's hitting, what an absolute joy to watch. But someone like Daryl Gurney has got the game and the firepower to neutralise to neutralize Jeffrey's game. Moving on to round two, our two Red Dragon champions we're going to have a look at. We'll start with the reigning world number one and world champion. The Iceman, Gatherin Price, will play the winner of Joe Cullen and Stephen Bunning. Gezi, how is he going to feel for the first time after the, the high and the jubilation of the Worlds? Is this going to be a little bit different and could potentially be a little bit flat or, or do you think he'll, he'll be okay in this one? I want to know how much he's been practising since the world. <laughs> All I ever seem to see him do is interviews and, and being on uh, Soccer AM or whatever. Listen, Gezi's going to be riding in the crest of a wave. Of course, he is. he's he's the world champion. And through becoming a world champion, he's, he's gone to world number one, you know, through sheer bloody hard work. I've got to say it like that, you know. Yeah, right. Determination and hard work. Um. Will he still be feeling those effects when it comes to playing his first match? Quite possibly. He's, he's enjoying himself at the minute, and rightly so, Phil. Um, it's not every day you get crowned world, world darts champion. Um, if he's still playing solidly well, he's going to be dangerous. But I think he could possibly still be on a honeymoon period where he's enjoying it. But um, listen, only time will tell that... that, that the, the dart player in me tells me he'll be ready. But my head is saying, <laughs> I'm not sure. I think he's still on a honeymoon with it all. <laughs> and then, of course, we've got the former world champion, Snake Bite, Peter Wright, who will play the winner of Ratajski and, and Whitlock. And does Wright need to bounce back from that disappointment? Not the performance, because he's he played some solid stuff, but the result against Gabriel Clements at the Worlds. He's the one that I mentioned a few moments ago that uh, who would have definitely been on the practice board. Um, Peter will be bitterly disappointed with his defence of his world championships, I think. Um, fantastically well claiming the world championships. And obviously, he's the defending Masters champion. So he actually went on from the world championships to win the next TV event a few weeks later. So he wasn't on a honeymoon period. But that's the one thing with Peter, a grafter, an absolute grafter. And, yeah, he's going to want to put some wrongs to right. You know, he's going to want to say to people, yes, you know, I, I, I've, I've relinquished my world crown, but that doesn't make me a bad dart player. And that's one thing he certainly is not. And I think this is an event for him. He's had time to reflect Maybe look at his setup, look at a few other things, and I think he's going to come out all guns are blazing. And I think he's, I think he'll be relishing and can't wait for him to get back up there to start defending this Masters Masters tournament. As always, out of the twenty four names, you know what I'm coming. You know what's coming next. <laughs> if you had to put your your twenty pence on one of the twenty four participants, where would it be going and why? I think. I think Gerwin Price is still on a honeymoon period. So I'm not going to pick Gerwin Price. I think there's going to be... I think the winner's going to come from either MVG or Peter Wright. 
potential I semi-final think, clash. Yeah, I think I think Peter Roy has got something to prove to himself um, because of he knows he can do better. MVG knows his game's there, although it's sort of like a little bit hit and miss at the moment. Um, yeah, I, th- I think the win is going to come from one of those two. I'm not going to pick one. It's going to come from <laughs> You're not going to hold me to ransom on that one, Phil. <laughs> Colin, absolute pleasure to have you on Red Dragon TV. Red Dragon TV, as always, mate. Thank you very much for joining us. And of course, please check out all Red Dragon social media handles: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, for all the latest stuff. The 2021 launch, of course, came out just before the world. Plenty of stuff there, and some great looking stuff, Jaws, as well, isn't there? On the new launch, there is, mate. There is. Listen, get yourself to Red Dragon. Red Dragon windmill, we rule the world. <laughs> Jaws, thanks for taking time out as always, mate. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much, mate. Absolute pleasure, Phil. Thanks very much, buddy.